joining us on uh, education, freedom, and parental rights. So, uh, first, I want to introduce Kevin Roberts, who is the executive director of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And, um, and then Jeremy Newman, who is the uh, director of public policy for the Texas Homeschool Coalition. Well, let me just start off uh, by giving uh, both of you gentlemen just an opportunity to talk a little bit about y'all's organizations and, and, what, uh, and what each does. So, so Kevin, would you just tell us a, lot, a little bit about the Texas Public Policy Foundation? And I know we were speaking earlier about kind of the genesis of the organization that you should be talking about. Sure, thanks for having me. The Texas Public Policy Foundation is the largest public policy organization outside of Washington, D.C. I wish that we were smaller because that would mean we would have fewer excesses in government. But we are that big, now very active in D.C. We were founded 30 years ago on education freedom and tort reform. We have helped others succeed in the latter and still working on the former, which is why I'm here to speak today. Thanks, Peter. Jeremy, same, same question. Just share a little bit about the uh, Texas Home School. Are we on now? There we go. So uh, THSC has been around for about 30 years, and uh, it originated after there was a Supreme Court decision in the late 80s, early 90s, called the Leaper case. And the issue being litigated was whether or not homeschooling was legal in the state of Texas, and whether homeschoolers were exempt under the compulsory attendance law as a type of private school. And so that went all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court. They ultimately ruled it is exempt, and it's been treated that way for the last 80 years. The state can have suddenly reversed its opinion on the subject. And so we've had this very gradual process ever since then of kind of holding back the tide. Of, you know, once you get the decision, you have to enforce it, because the court doesn't go out there and enforce it for you. So you have the bureaucracies and the legislatures that you have to deal with. Um, and so in practice, that means you know, working with school districts who don't know the, the rules, or basically anybody behind the desk in any bureaucracy anywhere that doesn't, you know, where they think it matters if your student was educated or was being educated. So Social Security, Child Support, all of these issues suddenly become a huge issue for homeschoolers because the person behind the desk doesn't know whether or doesn't believe that your education was legitimate. And it was really started on the premise that, you know, we believe that families were best equipped to raise their children and make decisions for their children. And I think that that has shown itself in the empirical data where homeschoolers and tr traditional private schoolers score well above the national average on the standardized test. It's performed much better and it costs a lot less. And in addition to that, you know, it's not just about academics. That we've, we've moved beyond just the academic element based on the belief that families have the right to raise their children, not just educate them. And so you get into family law issues and medical issues and all sorts of things where the, the main question I'm going to ask is, at what point is the state allowed into this relationship? And uh, from our perspective, you know, there are very few situations. And so we've been around for about 30 years, and you see us the legislature every year on scope of issues, all based around that premise of the fact that the family should be the ones raising the children. Well, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the legislature. So um, just um, briefly, what is the latest update on the school choice movement in the state of Texas. I know there was there was uh, a lot of momentum last session. There were several bills uh, that the Senate got some uh, movement on, not so much in the House. Uh, what Looking towards the next legislative session, what is the status of the education freedom movement here in Texas? Great question. I'll start by saying, in spite of all of the great things about Texas, one of the not so great things is that we have very limited educational freedom. If you homeschool, you have educational freedom, although Jeremy will tell you, I say this as a homeschool dad, that there's some work to be done there, and, and the homeschool coalition, of course, is leading the charge. If you're wealthy enough to send your child to private school, or if you are lucky enough, literally just lucky enough, to win a lottery to get your child into a charter school. That is literally the extent of educational freedom in Texas. So if you're one of the one million kids who reported to school a couple weeks ago in a failing school, the D or F school, and your parents want to send you to some school other than the one that's in your zip code that isn't serving you well, 
you don't have any educational freedom. And so, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, along with a, a host of, of other statewide organizations and national organizations, has been trying to work on this by getting over the years either a tax credit scholarship or an educational savings account or charter schools expanded. And we keep running into one obstacle. And that is this desire to perpetuate a system rather than to allow each individual human person, each child created in the image and likeness of God, to flourish. And I'll tell you, Texan to Texan, Christian to Christian, I think of, can think of few things morally worse than that. It is an abomination for Texas to be not leading the pack and, in fact, really lagging behind. And so, looking ahead to next session, we want to help Homeschool Coalition expand homeschool freedom. We want to make sure that every child in Texas has the opportunity to apply the tax money that is given him or her to the appropriate education of his family's choice. It doesn't seem like rocket science. Most other states have done this. But we, what we keep running into in Texas is this myth that we need more money for education, when in fact what we need is more education for our money. <laughs> Kevin, you, you bring up, you know, uh, that some other states have, uh, Texas has not led on this issue, other states have. What are, I mean, there's been a, a number of different initiatives on the school choice front, I know, in a number of states over, you know, many years now. What is, what is the status of how these other programs are working out? Is, um, are we seeing uh, in places where school choice has been, uh, you know, put into place that public schools are suffering because of, because of that? Great question. We're, we're a 501c3 think tank, so we call a spade a spade. Some members of the legislature call us the umpire. Some of them celebrate that, others don't celebrate that. But I will relate facts, not to be ugly about anyone. I'm a fifth generation teacher and school leader, so I love public schools. To the heart of David's question, our research shows, the research of all host of education policy organizations shows, that when you implement any kind of school choice, not only do the students participating in that school choice program benefit, but guess what else happens as a result of competition? Public school students improve. In fact, we just concluded a, a study of the 32 gold standard studies that have been done in the last few years about the success of school choice programs. All but one, so 31 of those 32 are resounding successes, including for the students in public schools. The one exception, my home state of Louisiana. And being from there, I can tell you that it will always be the exception to success. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think we have someone on our staff that's from Louisiana. Where's, where's Nicole? Um, no, and so, um, and, I, and I do want to um, kind of touch on a, on a different subject as well, but I do want to give Jeremy an opportunity because I know the Texas Homeschool Coalition has been supportive of, of the effort for education freedom in Texas. But Jeremy, could you share with us a little bit just from the from the homeschoolers' perspective, from your organization's perspective, um, on the on the school choice issue? Sure. So there the there are a couple of facts that you will find if you start researching this. The first one is that if, if you count DC as a state, technically it's not, but if you count as a state, there are 30 other states that have types of school choice programs, 34 different programs between those or 64 programs between those 30 states. And all of them have been um, successes in some regards. Some of them have been, well, one of them has been failure, uh, failure in certain regards. I think specifically in the funding aspect of our call. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that you know, if you came in from the outside, having never worked in any of these forms of education, you would find several things to be true. First one is that there are only a handful of different styles of education when you divide them into groups. The second thing is that by the numbers, the public school system is literally the worst performing. Now, I don't think that it's because the teachers are bad, necessarily, or that even a majority of the people in the system are bad. I think it's because you get good students and good teachers and you put them into a bad system and you and produce a bad result. And so the question that we should be asking ourselves, in my opinion, is how do you eliminate the barriers for entry for people to move from that system into the systems that objectively work better? And the, the biggest barriers that you find are things like school choice, for example, where anyone in the private system is currently paying twice for education. They pay once for their own students and once for everybody else's students. A lot of families cannot sustain that. And if you're in the homeschooling community in particular, you don't just 
incur extra actual expenses, you lose the form of income because one of the two parents is now staying at home educating the kids. And I, I have these conservative people tell me, it's like, well, you're talking about subsidizing a private industry. I'm like, the subsidy exists already. Like, we're not talking about taxing, putting on more taxes or taxing new people. We're talking about how to equitably distribute money that is constitutionally required to be taken already. Like, we have to have this system, this public funding system, so the question is how do you produce the best result with it? And if you eliminate the, the barriers to entry, which one of them being that currently people are paying twice in the private system, another one that we're working on being that a lot of homeschool students in particular have no access to extracurricular activities in rural areas or only access to super expensive ones in, in the other areas, and so people move to the public school system because they have to choose between the form of education they want or the, the career opportunities through the extracurricular activities. So if you eliminate those barriers for entry, then you allow people to move from the system that's objectively doing the worst into the systems that are objectively doing the best. That just seems like common sense to me. And the, the problem that we've had is on the one hand, the, I would say the education lobby, not necessarily all the education, all the people in the system, but the education lobby likes this monopoly so it's not interested in giving that up. And on the other hand, I've actually heard um, this argument from within the conservative community from some people that they fear the idea of government becoming involved in any type of private industry, which I totally understand, but that's a data question in my opinion. It's like, how has that resulted in other states? And not a single one of the other states that has done this has ever seen a regulation increase on people who didn't participate. So, so you can't approach it saying, I don't want to pass school choice because your choice will affect me. That's demonstrably false. It's never happened in a single other state. So the only other option you have is to say, I don't want you to participate because I think your decision is the wrong decision. Right? That's the clearly liberal leftist opinion um, that, I mean, that's fine if you want to take a position, but don't call it a conservative opinion when you do that. Because it's clearly not. So from our perspective, it's if you're going to make this decision based off of, on the one hand, the clear data, and on the other hand, the simple value, the belief that people should be able to make their own decisions, then it's an easy answer to make. Um, we are running up against a hard deadline, but I want to give um, both of y'all an opportunity to talk about some of y'all's uh, priorities and issues that you think um, are going to be extremely important heading into the next session. I know Jeremy and I were discussing one of the, the big issues that they have um, gotten across the finish line in the Senate several times is the Tim Tebow bill. Um, Jeremy, would you just share a little bit about Texas Home School Coalition's um, kind of probably setting into this next session? Yeah, so we'll, we'll be out there on a range of issues, but I'll mention two particular ones. So the Tim Tebow bill is what I alluded to earlier, which was allowing home school students to participate in UIL extracurricular activities, which they're currently paying for through their tax dollars. 35 other states allow that to happen already. Texas does not. We've passed it through the Senate the last three sessions in a row, and it's died by one vote in the House Public Education Committee all three times. So we'll have a new speaker, which means we'll have a new committee this time. Hopefully that means it's better. It would be hard for it to be worse, since obviously it didn't produce the right result the last three times. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I mean, it's, it's worked so well in all of the other states that there's really not a great argument for why we're not doing it here in Texas. The, the other issue that I'll mention is, I talked before about how THC isn't just involved in the academic part of the battle, but we believe that families need to be able to make decisions at a fundamental level. And this has really started playing out in the family court system in particular, where there's this major question of under what circumstances should the state be involved in the parent-child relationship? Should they be able to intervene and force one thing to happen over another thing? And the way it, in practice, works in the family court system right now is you have all the parties come before a judge, and the judge basically looks at this buffet of options that are presented to, to him or her, and, and they say, I like this one the best. Right? This one's the one that's in the best interest of the child. That's the term that you'll hear used over and over and over, and over again, best interest of the child. And because I think this is in the best interest of the child, that's what we'll do. Well, there are constitutional minimums that are supposed to be applied in these situations where the judge is supposed to be presuming that any parent that comes before the court is a fit parent, and that if they're a fit parent, then whatever decision they're making is the one that is in the best interest of the child. So that's what they're supposed to be presuming. In practice, that does not happen. If you get to the appellate court or the Supreme Court, you can vindicate that right 
but at the district level, the judge and attorneys simply don't know it because you have to be willing to read the last hundred years of case law to know that. Most of them don't do that. So we are working on condensing those principles and putting them directly into the family code, which is where 90% of these people look for all of their answers. And our hope is that if we do that, you can eliminate the mass confusion that's going on at the local level where you're involving yourselves in these family decisions over basic parenting decisions, things that no court needs to be involved in in the first place. Thanks, Jeremy. Kevin, final question, um, somewhat related. Um, are we going to get an opportunity to get a some kind of school choice bill passed this next session? We will we'll get an opportunity. I'm, I'm not sure how likely that is, but we will keep working on it. I'll add one thing for a piggyback on Jeremy's comment. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was always a conspiracy theorist. Someone here is a Russian. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll always be working on school choice because that's what we were founded on, but because Texas kids deserve it, we need to expand charter schools, we need to have education savings accounts. I will say, especially those who are interested in budgetary matters, the first thing that needs to happen is that we need to eliminate the Robin Hood tax. We must have school finance reform. We must eliminate half of your property taxes in order to convince people that the money that follows the child can, in fact, be spent on the education of families choosing. And finally, we do two higher ed things, and then I know we need to go there. One of them is, and I think you're thinking about this right now, we need to teach American history and Texas history better than we do. <laughs> Having taught a lot of American history and Texas history courses, I can tell you that the defenders of the Alamo were heroes. <laughs> And, and lastly, and it's important, is campus free speech. College students must be free to learn in order to learn to be free. We are failing our young citizens at even understanding how to be active Americans because our colleges are failing them. There is something called the University of Chicago Statement. It's a commitment that 45 colleges around the country have made to free speech. Guess how many colleges in Texas have adopted? Zero. Go home tonight. Write to your alma mater if it's in Texas or not, but especially if it's in Texas. Even my Aggie friends are conservative schools, not homeless. I can tell you mine hasn't. And make them sign that statement. If you want disruptive reform in higher ed that will trickle down into K through 12, focus on free speech for everyone, especially the conservatives. Thanks for having me. We have uh, um, completed our agenda for today, and I want to um, share a few final announcements. I'm going to let these gentlemen step off the stage before we share a few final details. Thank you. Guys.